All right, thanks, Vicky. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very uh, excited to be here with you. Uh, I see we have a, a nice, uh, nice group today, and I'll just say off, off the get-go that if there's any questions throughout the talk, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. If, if anything, I'd like to uh, do my best to address the topics that are of interest to you or uh, questions you may have, concerns um, about a slide or something I'm uh, presenting on. So um, the title of the presentation today, Mechanical Integrity Inspections of Ammonia Refrigeration, um, uh, is, is appropriate and particularly uh, I'm going to emphasize uh, today um, recognize and generally accept the good engineering practice and some of the, uh, the newer technologies that are being used, ultrasonic thickness testing, vibration analysis, and things like that that, that are uh, pretty uh, important in our, in our industry. I understand there was a talk uh, on Monday uh, done by, I think, Michael Schreck and uh, Miguel Sanchez about mechanical integrity as well. More on the, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was called Wall of Shame or something. I hope maybe some of you got to attend that. This will be a little different than that. Hopefully I won't try to uh, just repeat what they said where they were pointing out like practical common deficiencies and things like that. Um, I'll try to uh, uh, present some, maybe some different material. Oh, before I, before I get started, too, uh, just a, a little on me. So I'm from, from California, based in Central Valley, kind of uh, in between uh, Fresno and Bakersfield. So uh, my background is primarily with like the agricultural ammonia re refrigeration warehouses, uh, kind of up and down uh, the San, jo San Joaquin Valley. As Vicky said, uh, my back, uh, mechanical engineer, so um, that's kind of my, my background with, with refrigeration. Okay, so I was going to pose a question to start the talk today, which was, uh, why are there so many safety and environmental regulations? Uh, for, from a consulting standpoint, as a consultant, there's often the impression from private, private industry, like, oh, the government is just overbearing, and there's just too much of this and uh, too much of that, and they're always changing, and there's no, no consistency, and um, these are just kind of the kind of the common, uh, maybe the common perception, or, a, or maybe not the common, but a, a perception that's out there. Um, and before, before addressing that, um, I, I just wanted to go back in time a little bit, because I think I can kind of answer that uh, to some extent. And probably preaching to the choir to a group of mostly, mostly regulators, but I think what, what you guys do in doing your inspections and so forth can be really valuable to the public at large. So most of you in this room probably remember or at least have heard of the Bhopal India incident from uh, 1984. Uh, historically, it's probably the most well-known process safety accident in the history of, in the, history of the world. A uh, really tragic incident. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about it, getting, getting to the point of answering my question. Uh, a little background on Bhopal. Um, a company called Union Carbide had built the plant in the 1960s to produce a, a, a dangerous chemical. You can read it up there. And on, in 1984, in December of 84, um, there was an accident. Um, and that accident led to a large chemical release of a chemical pesticide um, that killed many people. You can kind of see some of the stats here, absolutely devastating. Um, thousands died immediately. Um, thousands died uh, in the next few weeks. Really there's only estimates as to the catastrophic nature, how many people were affected. Uh, interestingly enough, in my Popular Science magazine a couple years ago, there was even a, a full page uh, picture. You could see a, a big problem there, right? Six fingers. And the hypothesis of the article was that it was a chemical accident. Whoops. Uh, it was the result of Bhopal, the accident of 84, that, that India still has an increased number of birth uh, abnormalities compared to the rest of the world. Okay, that's not necessarily proven or for sure, but that's what the article was saying. And the, the point being that these uh, chemical accidents um, have, can have lingering effects for long, long periods of time. So, um, and, and so why does this matter about a mechanical integrity talk for ammonia refrigeration? You might be, are you in the right talk right now? And, and I, my point is, uh, the cause from the Bhopal accident, um, while maybe it's not 100% certain, um, is, is, uh, is traceable. There's, there's reports. So the employees of the Bhopal uh, facility said that the, the accident occurred when workers who were cleaning out a clogged pipe um, 
about 400 feet from the, from the tank ca caused a problem. Union Carbide, the employer, on the other hand, I don't know why that's shifting on itself. Union Carbide, on the other hand, um, said that water was introduced directly into the tank. So the release happened when water went into a tank, and there's like a differ differing uh, perspective from the uh, employees versus from management as to what caused the leak. Okay? Um, then the government did a study as well, determining that um, uh, the storage of, of the chemicals inside the tank was beyond recommended levels. We might start thinking operating limits, consequence of deviation, right? So they were filling a tank beyond those levels. Poor maintenance practices, mechanical integrity, uh, failure of the safety systems due to poor maintenance. One of the big tragedies when I was in, in, in college, in my engineering, uh, in my engineering classes, uh, I had to do an engineering ethics class. And one of the studies I had to do was on the Bhopal India uh, event. And one of the tragedies of Bhopal was that they had this comprehensive engineered safety system uh, to prevent what occurred from occurring. But on the day that the accident happened, that the tank was overfilled, or water entered the tank, it didn't work. Uh, one of the reasons it didn't work uh, was because those uh, functions had never been tested throughout the life of, the, throughout the life of that chemical process. So. Um, Another one here, the last one here, uh, safety systems had been switched off to save, to save energy. So they had just turned them off because they were, the safety systems that were in place consumed energy. So all this happened prior to process safety management, prior to risk management, prior to regulations such as CalARP. Okay? Um, but you can see a lot of the principles of the things that you enforce, particularly um, in, the in the arena of mechanical integrity, Testing, uh, testing and inspections, um, operating limits, and the consequence of, of deviation. You can see them uh, even built into this uh, accident to, to some extent. So other factors, um, Union Carbide had made large attempts uh, to reduce expenses. So they, had, they were struggling financially and had made large attempts to, including cutting back on uh, personnel. Um, there were examples of leaking pipes that they knew of that they hadn't replaced. Um, some of the employees did not speak English, but yet only had access to manuals in English. That's really near and dear to uh, the demographics of, of where uh, I am. Um, and the MIC tank alarms had not been working for, for several years. Okay? So, um, these are just a few more. I don't think I'll uh, uh, go, over, go over this. Uh, but there was uh, several operators that indicated that the pressure gauge or parts of the equipment had been malfunctioning for long periods of time, uh, over a week, um, and, it, and they didn't replace it. Um, carbon steel valves had been used at the factory, even though they were known to corrode. So a lot of, a lot of things, when you add that up, that you can see uh, led to uh, some of this accident. So, Bringing this home to ammonia, um, this is just a link from the last like month or so of just some relevant things that have come across the news of, a, of ammonia leaks in the past um, in the past month or so. And the point being, I think to answer my question on the first slide, if I haven't if I haven't done it yet, the reason there's so much regulation, the reason Coupas exist and CalARP exists and all these things is because as an industry, uh, we have too many accidents. So too many accidents uh, uh, still, still occur today, okay? Um, even, as preparing, even in preparing this, I think I've probably made my point, um, even preparing this talk, uh, just some things that have, big things that have made the news recently in the last couple months. Um, workers evacuated, something here in our Central Valley, and then this one just this week, you know, in Long Beach, an, an ammonia accident. So they're happening, I mean, almost like on a daily basis, you see something come across the news. Uh, some of that's maybe the speed, uh, the speed of which media travels, and definitely that's, that's part of it. Um, but still, as, a, as an industry, we need to do a better job of preventing um, this kind of stuff from, from occurring, okay? Um, there was a study done uh, by IIAR, the International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration. This was, it's a little dated, it's a couple years old now. Um, uh, but the study was uh, sent, surveyed to all the members nationwide on why, uh, two questions were asked. Where have ammonia leaks occurred at your facility? That was the first question. 
And the second question is why or what caused the accident uh, to occur. I actually printed out, not enough for everyone in the effort to go green, but I printed out a few if you want one afterwards, uh, the results of the survey of the article they put together. You could come grab it. Um, so this is a statistic from the results of that survey, which is why the accidents occurred. So they surveyed uh, about 400 accidents that occurred nationwide and asked why did the accident happen. And you can see the results there. The predominant cause of the accidents, uh, the biggest piece of the pie, 60% is human error. Okay? The number one cause of, of accident in an ammonia facility is human error. Um, the second biggest piece is mechanical failure. Okay, and, and then the final remaining piece, a small sliver, are, is labeled as other, um, and in the survey said natural disasters, fire, uh, ammonia theft, uh, etc. cetera. So um, when we come to the topic of mechanical integrity, obviously uh, mechanical failure <laughs> falls into mechanical, uh, the mechanical integrity umbrella, but also human error does as well uh, because uh, sometimes a mechanical inf failure uh, is related to human error, right? Because, for example, when a piece of equipment may not be maintained properly or may not, the, the proper things aren't being checked on the equipment on a regular basis, um, which is a human error or a training uh, type of recommendation. So, interesting article, uh, and again, you could pick up a copy if, if you're interested. So, to, to answer my question, which I already did, why are there so many safety uh, and environmental regulations. The answer is that here historically um, there have been huge accidents that have caused immense damage nationwide and worldwide and that's the reason um, that's the reason why we're here today. That's the reason for the safety days that happen throughout the state and the country. That's the reason for um, well, that's part of the reason, at least, and that's part of the reason for organizations like RITA, IIAR, uh, to help uh, promote this industry in a safe manner. So um, I know you guys know this, but I like to talk on the general duty clause when I give a presentation just to remind everyone uh, the general duty clause um, states that all facilities that use hazardous chemicals in any quantity have to do it safely. Okay, because there might be the temptation, there might be some of those out there that are the less than 10,000 or, or maybe even the, the right around 500 pound facilities. Like, ah, I don't have to do it, I'm, I'm too small. But really, you do have to do it. I just got recently done with even a US EPA Region 9 inspection of a, of a CalArp facility. Um, uh, they certainly care about the way they maintain their equipment. Um, just because they're under the US EPA threshold, they're still. Uh, US EPA is still interested in them, uh, main, their maintenance records, having a program that complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice. So regardless of chemical inventory, it's important um, that the equipment's maintained in a, in a proper manner. So what, what is required when it comes to mechanical integrity? Um, I want to cover that briefly before getting into the, maybe the substance, just to remind ourselves, just I know you guys probably mostly know this, but what does the law actually say is required, and then the practical working out of that for an ammonia refrigeration plant, okay? So what I got here was uh, taken out of the, just straight out of the CalARP, uh, CalARP regs. Um, so mechanical integrity requirements, a facility must uh, do inspection and testing, okay? I must do inspection and testing. Inspection of their equipment, on testing of the functionality of the equipment, okay? And we'll we're gonna talk more about that. Facility must, under the mechanical integrity requirements, must train their employees. So, I mean, I guess that should, should make sense, but not, not always so much. It must, if you're expecting an employee to do the inspection and testing, you know, train them how to do the inspection and testing. And uh, in the previous talk that was just in this room, uh, uh, which Don Tragathon was doing, he was uh, going, even going over that, like what to train an employee on whose, whose job is to do a daily inspection of refrigeration equipment. Very important. Uh, we run into facilities, for example, who uh, maybe we've set up a checklist for them to use, a daily checklist to check pressures and temperatures, and they've given the responsibility of performing the checklist to the uh, quality control manager or something for the fruit who, who just is looking at a gauge and writing down, an ant, uh, writing down the number, but the, the meaning of that isn't, uh, isn't evident to them. So uh, training is very important. Uh, third is written procedures. So you need to have procedures on how to test and inspect the equipment. 
Um, the fourth uh, and, and one that I really want to talk a lot about is a correction of deficiency. So mechanical integrity inspections yield results of some kind. Um, the results must be addressed. Okay? Um, they must be addressed. That's uh, not like optional. So uh, facilities really, really need to understand that. Um, when they hire someone to do a mechanical integrity inspection, when they bring in a consultant or a contractor and that person um, does an inspection on their behalf and puts together a report on their behalf, it's as though um, the facility themselves is saying that they're going to do these things. And often that's a, that's a disconnect we see in the industry where maybe they've hired someone and they think the act of doing the mechanical integrity inspection equals full compliance, where that is part of the compliance, but now the fulfilling of the action items uh, to satisfy the full um, recommendations. And finally, quality assurance is uh, mentioned, and that's one I've not talked a ton about. I'm going to hit on that a little bit later on. So um, when you look at the law, whether it's CalARP or PSM, RMP, any of those, um, and you look at the list of equipment covered, it's not comprehensive. Uh, to our industry. CalARP lists uh, those um, six bullet points that I have up there that uh, mechanical integrity applies to pressure vessels, uh, piping, reliefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so, but you won't find anything on there like, let's say, about a liquid recirc package or a screw compressor or a um, ammonia adsorption tank or ammonia diffusion tank. I mean, this is, this is a general list for all chemical processes. Um, PSM um, regulation, and I know that's not the one you guys enforce, but it is a little bit different in its wording because it says it applies to all equipment um, and appurtenances. That's their fancy little word to say everything. Um, but as you'll see on the, the next slide, um, our recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice, which is requirement of mechanical integrity inspections, um, is in the law. So this is what um, can be confusing to people at times when maybe a, a regulator is asking for a bulletin 109 form, for example, and someone can't find that in the law and doesn't see, doesn't see why, hey, why, is, why is bulletin, why do I have to do a bulletin 109? I don't see that in the law. Well, yeah, it's not in the law. It's not written in the law, but recognized and generally good engineering practice, precedent in the industry, you might say, um, what is normal in our industry um, has been stated. It's been very clearly, um, uh, very clearly defined, and we're going we're gonna to talk about what is recognized and generally good engineering practice for our industry. Because the perception out there, again, in private industry, I said this earlier, is that things are changing. The things, uh, things are always changing. Like It's never the same. It's always something new that you're asking me to do. And, or, the law, or, the, or they might say the laws are always changing. Well, you guys know the, the laws that are, actually aren't always changing when like, it comes to CalARP. Um, it was written in 99. I think it was updated in 2004. Um, I think it's close to getting updated again. Um, but it's not like it's changing every day. The law is not changing. But there is truth that recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice that does change. There are changes. There's improvements in technology. Um, there's improvements in uh, testing methods. There's changes maybe in personal protective equipment. Things in the industry at large do change, and, and that's what gives that, that feel. Um, and changes for the better, I might add. So a lot of the changes that we see are for the better. They're safer, more efficient, uh, easier. So you can look at something like 25, 30 years ago, you're not going to have computer automated refrigeration systems for the most part. Um, or at all. Um, nowadays, it's a pretty standard thing for a new design. It's going to be pretty, pretty automated, a lot of built-in safeties. That's a good thing. Everyone uh, enjoys that and benefits from it. So um, it would be really strange to see a system built today that was totally operated by manual valves, for example, with no, you know, no solenoid valves, let's say, and it was an operator running around opening and closing things. That would, um, you know, that would be not in accordance with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice, even though, you know, 25 years ago, it may have been perfectly acceptable, right? So um, the frequency of inspections that need to be done um, must be based off of the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, 
RAGAGEP. So RAGAGEP is our uh, uh, new acronym that everyone's supposed to know these days. So I resisted it for a long time. It's too long. I just tried to say it, but now it seems to be pretty kind of part of the language of the industry. So RAGAGEP, something I think we should all just kind of start using, I guess. Um, and then prior operating experience. And this is, that one's really important. And as a consultant, I try to, try to implement that. You know, you, you might, we start with documents when setting up maintenance or mechanical integrity programs. Start with documents such as bulletin, yeah? We had a release of ammonia at a facility in Roosevelt due to a cracked soil in the Yeah, good, good question. So I'll, I'll repeat the question so the camera gets it. So the question, or he was commenting that there was a leak from a cracked solenoid valve. Um, no precedent in the industry necessarily for replacement of solenoid valves on a schedule. Um, comment on what components do need to re be replaced on a regular schedule, um, high and low side. So um, yeah, great, great comment. Um, I think the most famous component that gets replaced on a schedule that everybody pretty much knows about is our pressure relief valves, right? They're on the five-year cycle, pretty much standard in the industry, uh, based on manufacturer's recommendations, also based on ASME pressure vessel code. Um, that specifies a five-year replacement for pressure relief valves. That's pretty standard. Um, IIAR is actually doing a study. It's like in process. They commented on the results at the last conference, like developing a method for um, uh, not just going based off of five years, but going uh, based off of uh, some other factors, let's say em environmental and past history, kind of trying to give people more flexibility in this operating experience, um, but you'd have to be a really large operation, I believe, to justify the kind of testing you'd have to do even to get away from that five year. So regarding the solenoid valves, no, there's no uh, re recommended replacement of a solenoid valve per se, and I wouldn't recommend a replacement on a five year. However, solenoid valves, um, a solenoid valve is a component with moving parts. And just from like, hey, this would just be like machine design 101. Um, anything with a moving part will break, right? It will break. Anything with a moving part, you can imagine I get a paper clip and just, you just start bending it, uh, depending on how much, you, eventually it will break. So that's, that's something we, we believe it will break. Um, now, the time that it breaks, it could be in three days, it could be in 3,000 years, you know, based on all sorts of, all sorts of factors. So um, that's where maintenance comes in. So solenoid valves, the valve, you said the valve cracked. The body of the valve cracked? They did some study, metallurgy study on it. I don't know the exact outcome at this point. Kind of interesting. Yes, Don, you have a comment on that? Mm. They, they actually put out a recall because there was a deficiency in the laser well. And these accidents were popping up across the country and recalls came back to that valve. And the manufacturer put out a recall notice to the industry uh, a year ago that uh, it's an MA5 model that uh, people need to look at. So it may have been that was the crack. There was an experience like that in Oxnard. Hmm. So yeah, the call, I'll just again say for the camera, uh, what Don pointed out that there's a certain uh, brand of solenoid valve that was recalled about a year ago. It's been the cause of some accidents, and that very well may be may be the case. Um, manufacturing abnormalities, even with valves that haven't been recalled, um, think back to the chart, the pie chart with mechanical failures. We can't deceive ourselves. We're never going to make mechanical failures go down to zero percent. Right? I mean, that's not going to happen. We're not going to have zero failures. We would like to uh, make them less. So if we have some percent today, we'd like to lower that. Um, so, but a solenoid valve, there would still be, and just further answering your question, there would be, <clears throat> excuse me, recommended maintenance practice on a solenoid valve, particularly the, in the strainer 
um, that's associated with that solenoid valve, you know, cleaning it to prevent debris and so forth. But like a crack in the body or something, that sounds uh, pretty, uh, pretty significant and not just like a, a valve that wasn't cleaned or something. It's more, more significant than that. So, um, and then finally, the one that I think everyone kind of knows too is that inspections should be documented. So paper trail, but didn't get documented, didn't happen. And there's uh, specific uh, documentation requirements. So um, am, am I training? Um, you know, mechanical integrity training is really important. Um, and to be trained in how to do mechanical integrity well, you really need to be trained in, in how refrigeration works. Uh, it's hard to imagine one without the other. Uh, yeah, maybe you could be trained on doing some real simple tasks that are real specific in regard to, let's say, greasing a bearing or changing a belt or something without a huge understanding of refrigeration. But if you're expected to be testing safeties, just testing shutdown switches, um, changing oil and compressors, these kinds of things, your understanding of refrigeration, um, the cycle, is really important. And that's where um, I don't believe there's a better source for that than the organization of, of RITA. And I know it's gaining popularity with some of the Koopas locally, where, where I'm in locally, where they're really maybe not requiring it, but at least, at least emphasizing it. Um, but I think RITA certified, encouraging RITA certification um, not just going through a read a class, but actually going, getting certified. I'm a big, big fan of that. I think it says something about a basic level of understanding of a refrigeration system, the cycle, the high and the low pressures, the various components. Um, and it will help, um, help us all speak the same language, too. So that we're all coming from the same, uh, uh, the same same position. I understand, again, I'm talking with uh, Don briefly after his talk that there may be some interest in, like next year at the conference, doing a, doing like a read an eight hour like read a class for the Koopas. And I think that would be a fantastic idea and really, uh, really great for, for you guys. I know some of you in this room have gone through the read a class and maybe even got the certification as well, but there's two levels of certification. Um, so as a Koopa, I think this gives you guys uh, some real added, maybe some added clarity onto the understanding that someone would have. If they pass the Caro test, that should mean something. The Caro test is not an easy test. Um, that saying is not, it's not rocket science, but it's not, it's not something that is just a cakewalk that anybody, even an operator is going to sit down and ace. Um, and the Ciro test is, is a, again, it's a, it's a step above. Uh, so the Caro is for an assistant and the Ciro for the, uh, for the um, industrial refrigeration operator shows a high level of understanding, able to troubleshoot basic things. Um, but just like a driver's license too, uh, doesn't mean everyone's a good driver just because you have a driver's license. Same thing with Rita. It does not mean that you are absolutely free and clear of any, any other uh, responsibilities. So, but it is an indicator and something that from my perspective and with our customers and consulting, we highly uh, encourage. And again, there's no Luckily, with our industry, with ammonia refrigeration, um, we really don't have like competing organizations. We have IAR and RITA, um, and I believe they complement each other really well in terms of what their objectives are. I see IAR more on um, uh, the writing literature and doing training on the engineering side and in the, in the standards for system design. Um, and Rita, the, you know, the warehouse for all things ammonia training and for the operator to have resources in plain everyday language that's high quality and uh, serves them really well. So um, my understanding too, Rita has intention to add additional certifications for specialties and so forth and all of that is, is really great. So. Um, that's the, when it comes to MI, if you're looking for what kind of documented training for, for someone that's going to be doing MI inspection, that's where I would look. Have they got RITA training? And it may be that they could be an expert without have gone, having gone through RITA, but this again would be my, uh, my opinion, I, I guess you might say. So uh, writ written procedures. Um, is another requirement, and these can come in a variety of fashions. Um, this is still an area that's quite often lacking out there in terms of 
um, how do you, how are the mechanical integrity inspections, the procedures for those inspections um, laid out? And um, for our company, we, we, rec we kind of put them together with the operating procedures. So the maintenance procedures and the operating procedures are kind of um, uh, put in the same, same section, even of the CalArt program or the RMP. It doesn't have to be that way, um, but there does need to be written procedures. So those written procedures need to tell an employee um, uh, step by step uh, how to perform the inspection. And that would include all the relevant information as far as operating limits, um, deviations they might find, steps to take if those occur, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Deficiencies. Uh, deficiencies that come up during an inspection need to be addressed. Um, so the key word in this statement here, the must, they must be addressed. Um, unfortunately, still one of the most common problems that we find overall in CalARP is just past due action items. Whether it's a MI inspection or whether it's a PHA or a compliance audit, um, re recommendation or action items just not being addressed is still, is still a really common um, deficiency. And so, um, again, is why it's really important that a facility understand that doing the inspection is uh, the start. That, that gets them up uh, the list of what may need to get accomplished, but then completing those items is is absolutely important and necessary. Yeah, comment? Yeah, just a comment. When I've seen documentation that they will need to error inspections, I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to error inspections, and I've seen that they will need to Good, good comment. So the comment was uh, sometimes out there you find an inspection that indicates a problem but doesn't indicate when uh, it will be completed or when it must be completed. I hear you and I, if I understand correctly, and you guys could probably correct me from the conference, that's one of the proposed changes to CalARP. Is that right? Yeah, I see heads nodding. So one of the proposed changes is giving not just, so the way it's written now, you need to make recommendations, but I guess theoretically you could say do in 100 years. Of course, we all know that's silly, uh, but that still kind of goes on where things linger, 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 and the next inspection comes up where well, all the same recommendations are there. Um, so a uh, couple thoughts on that, because that's a really good, good point you brought up. Um, one is um, my perspective. I think um, we need to... Again, I'm, we're private industry, so I come from that perspective too. I'm all about being sensitive to cost, and I know that's the number one. Um, that's the number one thing, right? It's money. I mean, people would all have drive Cadillacs, right? If we, could, we would all drive the nicest car in the world if if we could afford it. So people are hesitant because these upgrades cost money, and that's where. Um, the deficiencies must be uh, corrected. There's usually more than one way to do that. And there's maybe temporary things that can be done um, in the form of administrative controls, policy, while working toward an engineering control. Uh, so what I mean is, um, you know, uh, there's a, let's say an MI inspection. I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking on the fly here. There's an MI inspection and, or a PHA could even be in. And there's a chance that this you know, piece of equipment might be impacted by a forklift. Like, oh, we could imagine that occurring. The consultant makes a recommendation. You need to uh, protect that from being um, from being impacted. So, the, maybe the best thing to do is to put some engineering controls, put some bollards there that it can't be impacted. Uh, maybe and then, and uh, but maybe in the meantime, even that day, um, you can create an administrative control, a sign. Um, something painted on the ground, a policy that redirects forklift traffic in another area um, while something better is occurring. But the other thing I want to say about this, too, is that when a recommendation is made, it should have a timeline, timeline on it. So, yes. PHA 
Yeah, so the PHA has to have a due date. Um, and, and I say the same on any, I believe that on any recommendation, I don't care if we're even talking CalARP or not, like if you're gonna recommend something um, and you're telling them you have to do it, we will all work on time schedule. We need to know when we need to do it by. Um, so go ahead, Baronia. Investigation. Investigation. Compliance audit. So they're going to put a time limit, but still it's going to be, it's not one year anymore. They took that one. They're thinking of a year and a half, maybe two years. But still it's going to be the same amount of time that they have to see the risk involved. And like you mentioned, the cost. Right. Yeah, so just to repeat what Bronia said, for, so it's on the camera, um, the proposed CalARP change is to mandate some time limit, and that's still up in the air, whether it's going to be a year and a half or something in that realm, um, for PHA recommendations, MI recommendations, compliance audit, and incident investigation recommendations to put a time limit, but it's still up to the COOPA and the facility, let's, uh, hopefully the private industry sees serious things as serious, uh, to evaluate the risk. And there are certain uh, things that need to be addressed. There may be the case where something does need to be addressed tomorrow, or the equipment is not safe for further use. It cannot wait a year and a half to uh, be uh, remedied or fixed, right? So that was a, that was a good, uh, good comment. So, um, okay. So common deficiencies, um, this is maybe the little section that overlaps with some of the other talks, but things that are just common that you find out there that um, pretty much every system that's more than a few years old will have to one extent or another, to one degree or another. Um, this is a picture of just various forms of corrosion. So uh, often in ammonia systems, they're, they're made out of carbon steel, they're connected with carbon steel pipe. Um, and again, carbon steel part, pipe corrodes. It's not a matter of is it corroding, it, it is corroding. What rate is it corroding at? If it's kept uh, clean and painted, um, it will uh, be a very slow process and it will last for a very long time. Um, if it's totally untreated and left to the elements and it's subject to wind, rain, dirt, and all the rest, um, it will have a very, sh and sulfur dioxide gas, if you're in the table grape industry, um, it will have a very short life very short. So um, th this is a common thing we find out in doing MI inspections. This picture here on the um, right side is of particular concern uh, where the pencil, it's a little hard to see on yours, but the pencil is showing a pit uh, which versus maybe what we typically think of when you think of kind of the orange color on carbon steel pipe of corrosion we maybe refer to as uniform corrosion where you have material loss spread out fairly evenly on a surface. Um, but a pit is actually more uh, significant or more severe from, from our perspective because pitting corrosion is likely where the hole is going to develop from the localized pit. And a pit is a form of corrosion where it's local material loss um, leading to an eventual, eventual pinhole leak. So, um, in fact, just working on a, with a customer, just, to, just before I walked in here on a phone call with them that has coils that are, are corroded and they wanted, uh, they want their coils tested. They want them tested with uh, like ultrasonic though to determine the wall thickness. Uh, discouraging that, or saying I don't think um, that's going to be that beneficial to you. And the reason is because is the problem in that case, because I've seen them, is, is the pitting. And, and technologies, even like ultrasonic thickness, which can tell you the wall thickness, on uniform corrosion aren't going to be that effective on a pit because you're not going to get the smallest, uh, you're not going to get the head inside the pit to measure the depth of that, uh, if that, if that makes, uh, makes sense. So that's a common, these are common deficiencies. Um, other, yes? So the IAR, uh, yeah, yeah, I can tell you what, what I say, <laughs> and, uh, and it's based off of IAR, what we tell our customers, um, 
when it comes to insulated pipe and doing mechanical integrity inspections, uh, we recommend uh, doing a thorough visual inspection of all pipes. So before you ever get into measuring wall thicknesses, pits, uh, ultrasonic testing, x-ray, whatever it may be, a thorough visual inspection. They use your eyeballs. They're, the be they're very valuable tools. They work really good and, and look at everything. So when it comes to insulation where you can't see the pipe and all you can see is the, the insulated surface, um, the, hopefully the jacketing. So ammonia insulated pipe should be jacketed, probably either with PVC jacketing or aluminum jacketing. Um, you're looking at the condition of that and you're looking for things like um, moisture on the outside or ice buildup on the outside. If you're seeing moisture and ice buildup on the exterior of the insulated surface, um, it's an indicator of what's going on inside or the condition of the insulation. Now in really, really humid environments, you will still get that. You will still get it. And so I'm not saying that it means that the pipes are horrible or anything, but if you got tons of ice buildup outside the insulation, probably your vapor barrier shot and the insulation's in bad case, I would guess you're gonna have some corrosion going on. So to answer your question, uh, Michael, our recommendation is when insulation looks right, when it looks like it's in good shape, when it's, uh, the joints are sealed, the jacketing's in good shape, um, all signs indicate it's fine, we don't recommend cutting into it because then you've uh, cut into it and you've just broken the, the vapor, you've made a break in the vapor barrier that you're gonna have to reseal up um, and, and so forth. Um, but if you see areas that are in bad shape, then that's where we recommend, all right, it's already in bad shape. You need to repair it. We're going to make that recommendation. Let's cut, it, let's cut a section off that'll be nice and clean where you can repair it, and let's test that area. Um, that's, that's our approach, our thinking on the subject. Now, I've seen, another, I've seen people that cut like uh, coupons in the insulation um, with plugs, and that's pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool idea. I think it's, I think it's a, a neat idea where they basically cut uh, squares or circles that can be removed. They can do their testing every uh, five years or as often as they have specified in their program and then they put those back. Again, my concern in that long term is I wonder um, if that's a source of infiltration into the pipe and damaging further uh, equipment. So, but they can't just not care about it because it's insulated. Um, or, or say, well, I can't inspect it because it's insulated. Then inspection of the pipe insulation goes a long, long, long ways. So, so, so other, other common deficiencies, you probably see a problem here in this, one of these pictures, or both of them, but trees shouldn't grow on top of EVAP condensers, right? That's it's not a garden. You, you, <laughs> That's one problem. Uh, second problem, and it's again, maybe lighting's a little hard to see, but you see something, a hose dragged up there and a little, uh, kind of like a sprinkler deal you might put on your lawn. Eh, probably, not, probably not the way BAC or Evapco designed the thing, you know? Um, so, you know, you can, there's some indicators like that thing hasn't been Maintenance hasn't been done on that in a while. I don't think it's had an MI inspection in a while because how long does it take for a weed to grow, you know, 18 inches tall? A uh, little, little while because you gotta get, you got to get enough dirt and muck on top of the mist eliminators uh, for the weed to have some amount of root to, to grow up. So um, other um, just uh, crud on the side, uh, leakage from the condenser, an indicator of of issues with their, maybe with their water treatment, um, the integrity of the, the wall of the condenser, uh, et cetera. So the, the EVAP condenser, when it comes to um, prior operating experience, when we talk about cleaning an EVAP condenser, prior operating experience is huge. Because I think Bulletin 110 uh, for IAR Bulletin 110 says, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it says every month to clean it. Um, something like that. Uh, for a lot of facilities, that's pretty, pretty overkill, in, in my opinion. It's not necessary, but prior operating experience will, will clearly tell you how often uh, it, should be, it should be cleaned. If you're in a really dusty, dirty agricultural environment, um, which a lot of facilities we work with are, the condenser could be renamed uh, uh, air filter. <laughs> 
because it pulls that dirty air through water, which washes all the dirt out, and you got super clean air coming out the top, um, and then the, the dirt sits in the bottom, right? That's why it gets all mucky and mucky and dirty. But if you're in an urban environment and um, it's uh, mostly city, not a ton of dust, uh, the the amount of of crud that will build up in the bottom will be less. It will be very site specific is what, uh, what I'm trying to say. And so operating experience uh, is real, uh, real valuable uh, when it comes to EVAP condensers. Okay, uh, pressure relief valves, common deficiency still. It's getting a lot better because most uh, Koopas are, you know, enforcing the five-year replacement. And so that's getting a lot better, but we still, this wasn't taken too long ago. Well, Michael, this is kind of a good example. So if we come across this kind of stuff, let's test it. This is obviously in bad condition on the insulation side. On um, the relief valve side, those are old relief valves. Um, they're not vented properly, of course. There's all kinds of, all kinds of problems going on. Uh, here's another picture here. Um, problem, right? It's a relief valve that has a nipple coming on the outlet, a 90 pointed down, another nipple, and a cap. <laughs> so it's got some little cute piping ultimately capping the relief valve. So how does a capped relief valve work? It doesn't. To answer the question, it doesn't work. So this would be an example of when should this get fixed? Like now, yeah, like, there, like there's nothing protecting that piece of equipment. So if it was designed into the equipment as a safety device, the safety device is gone. You think, you know, it's like the, it's like the example of Bhopal shutting off the safety system to save energy. They plugged these probably, I'm just guessing, I don't know why they plugged them, but probably because they lifted and then they didn't fully reseat and it was seeping ammonia out and it was bugging them. <laughs> they, they, wanted it to, they wanted it to stop, and one way to stop it was to put a plug in it, okay? Um, that would be something to look at as a bit, real significant violation that should be corrected ASAP. Um, so relief valves are still, still an issue, and, and now even that relief valves are getting uh, sized or are getting replaced pretty regularly, one thing we run into quite frequently is still the, the discharge piping. Uh, being appropriate. So relief valves that are discharging like right at uh, eye level or, or even, even lower than that. Um, relief valves discharging inside of buildings, for example. Um, inside buildings of, let's say I was at a facility that had a liquid research package with a, um, you know, a little oil pot and the relief, the oil pot, or the, the research package was vented properly, but the little oil pot had a relief valve. It was just right there inside the processing areas. Like if that uh, if that relief lifts, um, it's going to expose um, hundreds of people uh, unnecessarily to, to ammonia that don't need to be exposed. Okay? Other common, other common things we find out there in, in MI inspections that come up, um, and, and they become a kind of an area commonly with our customers of like... Um, Confusion and frustration, I might say, um, is in regard to, um, that's a, showing a ventilation fan. I just pick, picked one off the internet. But an engine room ventilation, um, secondly, an ammonia detector. And those two are, are common areas of frustration because current um, code requirements specify how engine rooms need to be ventilated for continuous exhaust. Uh, for the emergency purge in the case of a leak. Um, but people often say correctly, well, this place was built 30 years ago. That wasn't required then. I built it according to the codes at that time. And that's accurate. I, I will agree with that. So when a code changes, and they're usually on three-year cycles, codes change on three-year cycles, it is not required that every facility upgrade every single thing they have to meet the new code. That'd be enormously expensive and not a requirement. However, some of these things, uh, so the basis of requiring them is not because it's in the code. The basis of requiring it from an MI inspection or a health and safety inspection is because it's a, it's a health and safety uh, concern for employees or the public at large. So that would be the, um, the reasoning, if that makes sense. So that comes up quite frequently where we reference something. Now, when they go to install one, if it's been recommended, let's say a, 
an engine room, a machinery room that has no ventilation or very in, inadequate ventilation, and we recommend to install a ventilation fan, well, we're going to recommend to install it according to code, right? So they're not, they're not installing it uh, because it's in the code per se, but if you're going to go through the process of upgrading and doing it safely, do it according to the code, if that makes sense. So ammonia detection is, is one. I mean, there's still a lot of facilities out there that uh, don't have ammonia detection, um, uh, either stationary or even, even um, uh, portable uh, detection, uh, meaning handheld detectors or, or worn detectors. Um, and I know it's not a, a CalArp, this thing I'm about to say is not a CalArp issue, but Cal, you cannot satisfy CalOSHA in terms of making sure your employees are not subject above PELs without some kind of detection. So Cal OSHA's PEL for ammonia is 25 ppm. Um, you really have no way to demonstrate that if you don't have, if you're not measuring it in some fashion. So uh, I really think ammonia detection at this day and age is a, something that facilities uh, should have to one extent or another. Now there are, there are issues with ammonia detection um, that I'll talk a little bit about one of, again, I mentioned this, but one of the industries we work a lot in is the table grape industry, where, where we are, there's a lot of uh, table grape cold storages that utilize sulfur dioxide gas um, for fumigating their grapes. So inside an ammonia warehouse, um, they inject sulfur dioxide gas, uh, which is another, of course, another CalArp chemical, but so you got a combo, th uh, combo thing going on. Well, it just so happens sulfur dioxide gas pretty much destroys everything, <laughs> pretty much destroys everything, nothing, especially these high concentrations. So it'd be all great and everything to put one of these inside the room, um, but it'll get ruined, uh, it'll be done after a month. Um, and unfortunately, th there's not technology that I'm aware of uh, to remedy that. Uh, so what that means is that you can't really monitor the ammonia in the room while it's being gassed. So what's common in our in our area at least, and I, maybe even across the country to some extent, is what we call sample systems, where you draw air from the room uh, to a common sensor uh, through tubes using a vacuum, and you're pulling air, you're pulling air, and, and they maybe call them sniffers or something, you're pulling air from the rooms, and then when the room's being gassed, we shut that off, because we don't want to pull sulfur, sulfur dioxide gas, um, but then we're not monitoring ammonia anymore. But that being said, there should be no there won't be any employees in the room while it's being gassed, right? They they can't be because they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, live in that environment. So you know um, there has to be like reasonable reasonable approaches to some of the uh, problems faced there by by industry, um, and I know that that's one example. So um, another uh, common deficiency, and what's shown here on the right hand side, um, is that an e stop, a one one form of an e stop, a break glass switch. Um, this one, um, you guys have seen them, I'm sure. Got the little hammer hanging next to it. And what you do is you b break the little glass here, which releases the switch and will shut down. Um, generally, it shuts off the engine room uh, compressors um, in, the, in the event of a high side emergency. So often these are installed but have never been used or tested. So that should be part of a mechanical integrity program is testing the e-stop that it functions. Um, that it's, it's present and functions, okay? So quality assurance, this is a kind of just interesting, like maybe one of the more oddball parts of MI I isn't talked about a lot, but uh, quality assurance uh, is, is stated in the CalArp reg um, that new equipment must be suitable for the application. Don't see a big problem with this. I, don't, I haven't found too many places that are like, trying to design their own custom heat exchangers or something like that. I'm sure it happens. A couple come to mind, actually, um, that have done some of that stuff. But generally speaking, um, you're buying from uh, legitimate, reputable manufacturers, the Fricks, the Vilters, the uh, Mycoms, um, you know, Colmac Coil, and there's a number of uh, Evapco, BAC, a number of manufacturers that are well known that have literature that support it, are involved in the industry, um, and not a, not a big issue. Um, one thing uh, that does come up though occasionally, particularly on relief 
piping and sometimes, unfortunately, on other areas of the piping is um, components being used in a refrigeration system um, that are not, um, that, are, that have a brass or a copper associated with them. And as, as we need to know or emphasize, uh, ammonia is really corrosive to any copper and copper alloys, brass, bronze, etc. cetera. Um, we see it a, a lot on relief piping, um, especially the unions on, on relief piping uh, that have a small brass, uh, brass component. And, and it gives you an indicator, actually, that one's lifted because it turns that greenish color and it, it gives you a, a helpful clue that a relief valve has lifted. But in the ammonia system, that's one thing to look for. Another one is on the tanks, on the diffusion tanks for the facilities that have water tanks. Um, some, you know, brass and bronze is great in water systems. But on the diffusion tank, you don't really want a brass or bronze valve at the bottom. If it's fresh water, it'll be fine. But as soon as it has a, a release into it, you're going to start a corrosion problem on the valve, which will develop a leak on the, on the ammonia diffusion uh, tank or ammonia absorption tank. Okay? So is it existing equipment um, must be properly installed. That's another of the quality assurance requirement. And finally, um, maintenance materials and PPE um, must be... Uh, suitable for the application. So this is one that we, um, you know, for a facility that does their own maintenance, that should be evaluated as well during an MI inspection to make sure that the, their personal protective equipment. One thing to maybe to start asking in some of these places is to see their ammonia hose that they use. Or, or maybe don't even ask it that way. Maybe ask to see that what, what do they use do they use a hose to drain oil, for example? Because we have seen some scary things uh, from using a garden hose, air compressor hoses, various kinds of hoses in an ammonia for, a main, for maintenance type purposes for draining uh, and purging. So that's an area. Um, in fact, there was just a, you know, a story today as far as a hose that had, had broke and, and the final uh, kind of settlement in regard to that. Um, so hoses, hoses can break and there's a specific rating for ammonia for ammonia hoses that should, that should be used. If a hose is kinked and been driven over and stuff, it needs to be replaced. It's not, it's not safe anymore. Another, uh, another thing I want to point out in this quality assurance uh, uh, area is that there's other components that are not directly part of the ammonia system that are really important uh, to be maintained or be aware of. Uh, one that comes to mind is on for compressors that are water cooled, uh, recip compressors and uh, some screw compressors as well. Uh, there's a jacket water pump. I mean, you're talking a small pump. It may be one horsepower, it might be three, five. It's, it's not going to be anything substantial. But that pump, um, if it fails, if there's only one of them, uh, will cause the compressors to overheat and not be able to run. Um, and so it's just a good, a good thing for a facility to either have a backup of those pumps or at least have availability uh, replacement quickly and to know about that. So anytime there's one component that will cause a, a big failure of a system, uh, we consider that a critical component, even if it's a one horsepower pump that you could buy off of Granger, you know, um, it's in the facility good, best interest to even have a backup available. So. Oh, and that's, yeah, I, I guess I jumped ahead. So that would be like a, maybe a, what a jacket water pump might look like. Just a typical centrifugal pump, nothing uh, extraordinary. So uh, looking at quality assurance, um, so this would be the personal protective equipment, like a handheld monitor. It should be appropriate for use, uh, meaning it should be calibrated. There should be records uh, showing that. Um, for new equipment, um, it should be appropriate. T typically, like compressors, screw compressors will state that um, they're designed for R717. R717 is ammonia, uh, the, the designation for ammonia from, you know, from a thermodynamic perspective, and look for that. We occasionally find a compressor in an ammonia system that, that uh, says R22. R22 is a Freon, uh, a Freon refrigerant, and, and usually that just causes us to look further into it, and it's undergone some sort of retrofit, and it's fine, uh, but still, it makes us uh, uh, question uh, the... Uh, question the situation. Oh, one, one story I'll share briefly that we ran into because we were talking about brass and bronze. Uh, when compressors are shipped, um, they're charged 
um, they're charged up to some pressure with nitrogen and fitted with a gauge on the oil separator. So this is a screw compressor, a brand new screw compressor. That's why it's still wrapped in plastic and stuff. And they're shipped and they have some uh, nitrogen charge under pressure with a gauge. Well, the gauge they send is a little cheapo gauge. It's not like an ammonia gauge. It's a little uh, 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 gauge that, that is, um, uh, has some copper in it anyways and we had a situation where we installed it and that little thing wasn't caught um, and we hadn't even started up the compressor yet but we had introduced a little bit of ammonia gas um, um, you know to check rotation or something I'm not, I'm not even sure all the details of it but but it had been installed hadn't been started up yet and there was some ammonia gas in it well anyways uh, over the night that it just over that night the threads uh, corroded and it began a small ammonia leak um, just like that. It wasn't, uh, wasn't a significant thing, but just something like that to be aware of that kind of stuff. I wish, you know, in that case, the manufacturer wouldn't send it with that. But part of the startup procedure is to remove that gauge and either replace it with an appropriate gauge or whatnot. It's just there for the shipment to show that it's uh, uh, charged up. Okay. Oil is another thing. Okay. Quality assurance on existing equipment, oil uh, management. Um, the mixing of oils can cause huge problems. Start, start mixing um, various oils with various uh, properties, or you get someone that's a car mechanic background and just confident that he could rebuild anything and puts automotive oil in or something screwy. Um, you, you could be facing some big problems with your system that can lead to a, uh, lead to a system failure. So um, knowing what kind of oil your system has, what kind it uses is important and that it's main, maintained consistently. Okay, so Ragaget. What are sources of Ragaget? As Koopas, I hope uh, you guys have access to some of these things I'm gonna show here. I, I printed out several Bulletin 109 forms. I, I don't know if you guys have access to them or not, but IAR, I actually requested permission and they were fine with it that, that we print them out. So if you wanna take them, you can. Um, just for reference as an example of, of, a, of a standard form. But I'm going to walk through here um, some examples of, of what's considered RAGAGEP, recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice. The predominant RAGAGEP in our industry for mechanical integrity are uh, these two, historically, have been these two documents, IAR bulletin number 109 and bulletin number 110. So IAR, um, a long time ago, uh, wrote a series of bulletins ranging from 106, I think, up to 114 or 16, I don't know. They wrote several bulletins, about 10 of them probably, on various topics. These two happened to deal with the topic of maintenance and or inspection. Okay, when I asked, and that is where uh, these inspection forms that probably some of you have seen, because um, they got turned into you as part of the CalR program uh, came from. So they're in the back of bulletin number 109. Uh, it's a great, uh, great document. However, IAR gave me one um, contingency upon sharing these with you, which was to emphasize that I tell you that bulletin IAR's plan is to do away with bulletin number 109 and 110. They're go these documents are going by the wayside. Um, so bulletin 109 and 110, which are up here, this is what they look like. The forms at the back are two-sided. The front usually has the equipment info. The back has the checklist of what to do. Okay? But IAR is removing all of their bulletins. Okay? They're getting rid of every single one of them and replacing them with eight new documents um, that, are called, that they're calling standards. Okay? And this kind of sounds like just semantics, legal ease, and it kind of is. But Essentially, in a nutshell, what's, what's happened is that the bulletins became treated like standards, like codes, which wasn't really the intention of IIAR. When they wrote the bulletins, whenever those were written, they were written as a guideline, as a help to the industry. And instead, it kind of got taken in a sense, and the industry got bashed with their own little help, supposedly helpful tool. So IIAR is redoing um, their documents and writing uh, these eight standards. Uh, which are going to be written in code language, okay? So they're writing now with the idea that, okay, what we put down is RAGAGEP. And each one of these standards is going to have two sections. 
it has a normative section and an informative section. So all kinds of new vocabulary, but normative being required, you might say, required, everyone should do this, informative being optional or here's an example um, and so forth. That, hopefully, that, hopefully that makes sense. So you see all the various colors here. This is the stages of where they are in this process, which is going to be really important to you guys as Koopas. Um, one, two, and three are done. They're published. They're published documents in practice. So IAR1 is definitions. Ah, easy. That, so IAR1 just is kind of the table of contents, you might say. So it's just defining terms so that everyone's using the same language. Okay. IAR2 is a document that's been around uh, since the 90s, actually, and it's for equipment design. Originally, it was called equipment design and installation, uh, but as you can see, IAR4 is going to be installation, so they're kind of breaking it up. So this document is going to govern the design of equipment, um, so design of compressors, design of pressure vessels, design of condensers, etc. What needs to be on the nameplate? Those kind of things, okay? Um, and this is, again, it's already been uh, dis distributed, uh, already in production, already for sale. You can buy it off the website and so forth. IAR3 is all about valves, valve design, okay? And that, again, is already in, in production. It's already been released, okay? Um, uh, number four, um, okay, let me skip four for a second. Five and seven, the red ones, they are um, in public review right now. So these two documents are, have been released but are not final. So the way, the way that ANSI certification happens, uh, it's kind of a long process. So the committee writes the standard, they, uh, they put it out to the public, the public reviews, comments, and it goes through this process and it can take a while. So I've participated in the review of both these. Like I provide comments because I know it's going to affect me, our customers, our company. Um, and so any feedback is, is uh, welcomed and helpful. So these two will be the next two released. You can see one of them is about operating procedures. That will, uh, you know, that will obviously impact the, the Koopas, you guys, to some, some extent. Um, startup and commissioning. So this uh, will be an interesting guideline now that will affect MOC, PSSR, in CalArp, so it'll give us a, a clear idea of what the industry should be doing by and large on, on starting up a new system or a new component. Um, installation is being written right now, okay? So, and uh, I'm a, ah, I'm not on the committee, but a, like a corresponding member of this kind of committee here. And basically we're starting with two and re removing all the components of install, and, and, and this will specify um, how to put together a system, how to pressure test a system before starting it, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's what installation is all about. And then six and eight have, to my knowledge, have not been significantly started yet. And they, they probably, they may have outlines and so forth, but they're, the green ones are still going to be coming. And they cover two topics, which is maintenance, and then finally decommissioning. Okay, so they're calling this the suite of standards, and these eight standards um, are replacing all the old bulletins. Okay, so bulletin 109, bulletin 110 going away. Yeah, question. Um, so the question was, who's reviewed them? What agencies have reviewed them? I don't know the answer. So the public review is a public review. Um, so like you can go to iiar.org and like review yourself if you want, uh, five and seven. Send in your comments. Now, um, IAR does have a close alliance with OSHA at a federal level. And I'm only guessing, but I think that uh, there's probably been communication in that regard on that level, but I really don't have the facts on that to, to what extent. Yeah, do you have something there, Don? They have collaborated. Uh, before, before the uh, standard was put up peer review, it went to uh, Jim Lay and the, and the PSM group at Fed OSHA for their review and comment. Uh, comment coming back is whatever you put there, we're going to enforce. So, uh, but yeah, there is a there is an alliance. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. So Don just uh, agreed that there is an alliance between OSHA and uh, IIAR and some communication going on. Um, when I review them, I, when I'm doing a, like a public review, like from my perspective, I'm mostly look at, looking at it like what Don just said, like what's here is going to be enforced and trying to remove, like say, well, maybe this shouldn't be enforced in all cases, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Um, that's usually kind of the, pr the perspective, okay? So, yes? Yes. So that that? That yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, uh, if IAR was frustrated uh, with Bulletin 109 and 110 being used on a regular from a regulatory standpoint, is that why they're uh, making it normative and informative so that uh, regulatory agencies can't enforce it? I don't think IAR. I mean, I think I think IAR knows they can't stop anyone from enforcing anything. Um, that's one of the things I'm going to be interested to see how it works out, how the uh, informative section will be treated. Um, but there, I think, Michael, their main point is they're just now trying to be more careful with their language, knowing that what they write uh, will be treated um, as a, a, a standard, as a code, basically. It'll be, it'll be forced upon people, and so it's being written from that perspective. Um, these aren't like, I mean, so when it comes to like the design, uh, uh, installation, let's say, I mean, when you talk about installing an ammonia system, I mean, if you need to learn everything you need to know about it, I mean, you're talking about a 500 page textbook probably or more, you know, if, if you're talking low calcs and all this, that's not what this is. They, they, these are bare bones documents covering the, um, what they feel should be treated as, okay, everybody needs to do this. The rest of it needs to be uh, done by an engineer, uh, and so forth. Yes? Do the owners of the refrigeration companies, the ammonia have to purchase this thing? So the question is, do, ammo do owners, do people have to purchase these? And the answer is, of course they do. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So all, the books always cost, books always cost money, but membership, actually with IAR, if you are a member, um, these can be downloaded for free as PDFs. But memberships, membership costs money, so everything costs money. Um, yeah, Don. Yeah. So it has to be done right. Right, and they're working hard. They're working hard, and these are coming up in future uh, in a future slide. But I'll talk about now. They're working hard to coordinate with ASHRAE because ASHRAE has a standard, ASHRAE 15, um, and with the model codes, which are on a slides coming up more more rag again. But they're they're working hard to not have you know someone have to look at 15 different things to figure out what do I need to do here. Um, it's going to be hard to do, though. Yes? When I asked about the propane, excuse me, not propane, but the ammonia tanks, I assume they're listed or certified in some way, some body oversees approval of how tanks are constructed to hold ammonia. Is that separate from other separate entities in your industry? Secondly, are there unique things that the ammonia industry, such as uh, threads in the medical gas industry, they have certain kinds of threads designed so that they can't Yes. Uh, I'll answer your second one first, and the answer is no on the threads. So it's a standard, it's a standard pipe thread on ammonia system. Uh, tip, typically, I haven't seen any backwards or unique uh, th threads in general. Um, so that's that's the easier one one to answer. Um, as far as the governing body on pressure vessels, pressure vessel in an ammonia system uh, needs to be in accordance with ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code Section Eight. 
So that would be the governing uh, body. That being said, the ammonia pressure vessels are not um, permitted in the same way that, let's say, air compressors and boilers are. They're not permitted in that fashion. So, um, but they, they, so to be a certified pressure vessel manufacturer, you have to go through a rigorous, uh, rigorous protocols to satisfy that. And ammonia, what you're looking for as an inspector is the nameplate. Um, and you're looking for the little clover, <laughs> the little clover, which is the ASME clover punched on it. Uh, usually it has a U inside that clover, which uh, tells you um, uh, an unfired pressure vessel. When unfired means it's not a boiler, it's not a, got flames under it in any way. So um, interesting topic since it came up is what to do with the vessel that doesn't have a nameplate because it's so old or something or corroded off or whatever. And unfortunately, uh, I think EPA has been pretty clear on the topic. Uh, means if you don't have a nameplate, you're kind of up a creek. You need to get a nameplate, meaning go through some sort of vessel certification process. Um, and there's not, I mean, there's not really good news if you don't have a nameplate that I can see, uh, unfortunately. There's things you can do, like if you're concerned, if you're concerned, um, you can do testing. You can do ultra ultrasonic testing. So if you know it's carbon steel, um, you can test it and determine a thickness. But in the absence of the original design specs, the original thicknesses and so forth, you're, it's still kind of an estimation. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know what else to say about, about that one. So, um, so other RAGAGEP. RITA is a source of RAGAGEP. We talked about RITA in terms of training, but RITA has some recognized and generally accepted practices when it comes to daily inspections, daily logs. In fact, Don passed out a, a information in his talk about doing daily rounds. That's, Ragageb. When it comes from an organization like Rita, it's uh, uh, it's considered um, it's considered Ragageb. Okay. I mentioned ASHRAE 15. This is another pertinent standard uh, referred to frequently. Um, and then the uniform codes. Okay. This is a really confusing mess, uh, but you might run into it somewhat. So there's different uh, there's different codes that apply to different jurisdictions, and they're different from each other. So kind of in the way that CalARP, RMP, CalPSM, FedPSM are all about the same, mostly, but kind of different, you know. It's kind of, kind of the same in, in terms of when it comes to uh, model codes. But there's two main groups, which is the uniform codes and then the international codes. Most of the country uses the international codes, but California is in the uniform code. So California is actually in the minority and some other Western states still working off the uniform code. And California kind of even takes that and tinkers a little bit with their own model code called the California uh, Mechanical Code. So chapter 11 of the California Mechanical Code um, will specify uh, all sorts of information about the, how a refrigeration system must be designed. It would be a good thing uh, to have a copy of as a regulator, I'd imagine, if, if you could. Yeah. Oh, no, you pay for it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, all this, <laughs> so you, these organizations, hey, it's like uh, college textbooks. You know, they update them every three years. You got to buy them new, man. It's uh, frustrating. They're not, they're not cheap either. Um, so, yeah, every three years are in a cycle, but uh, these organizations here that ride them, yeah, they probably cost, I don't know, 150 bucks, something like, I'm, gonna, I'm just guessing. Uh, I haven't bought it in a while, but, um, so, uh, more ragagat. This is kind of the modern thing, especially for maybe the younger ones of us that like technology, but there's forums, industry groups that are really active. And while this is, don't, just because it's on the internet does not make it true, <laughs> don't, don't go that far, but, but you can find answers to questions on the internet. And I, I mentioned here uh, an industry forum, a pretty popular one on LinkedIn, uh, kind of run by the Garden City uh, guys that, that run the school out there. But it's got input from all sorts of sources. You can see here Eric Smith, he's one of the IAR uh, employees. Um, and as a regulator, I think it'd be a cool tool for you because you can go, someone's asking about a question about a solenoid valve getting stuck or a this or a that. And you might have 20 different responses from all around the country. It's quite, uh, 
quite uh, fascinating what uh, what technology allows us allows us to do now. So um, that's a really becoming another kind of realm of of Raga Gap. So um, let's check our time here. Yeah, our time's uh, quickly passing by. So. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of uh, this stuff here. In term, I was going to give some examples, but we've uh, covered them in terms of our, uh, just throughout the talk. So um, the last thing I wanted to cover today, and this is kind of uh, just uh, in closing, is to talk about some of new developments, uh, maybe you might say new studies in operation and maintenance for the larger organization, private industry that are doing <laughs> studies. There's been considerable money invested to figure out what is the best way to do maintenance. Okay, and this is a Department of Energy study. This you can get for free, though, so you can go download it. I also brought a few copies uh, about operation and maintenance best practices. And it kind of is, is going at some of the old school thinking about operation and maintenance. And the good news is, is what they're proposing lines up with mechanical integrity requirements. And the study shows it, sa it will save an end user considerable money. So I'll cover it briefly. So, we know this is called a bathtub curve. Uh, we know, we learn in you know, failure of things with moving parts that everything fails. And typically, failure rate here on the vertical axis uh, is, and then this would be time on the horizontal axis, failure is more likely in the infant stages because of equipment problems or manufacturing error, and then of course at the end of its life. So everything goes through this period where it has an infant mortality, a useful life period, hopefully that's a long time for us, and a wear out period, okay? And we look at it from a regulatory perspective, um, kind of thinking with our prevention program elements. This is our PSSR, right? Pre-startup safety review, when you start up equipment, make sure it's designed right and installed right and functioning. Once it's working, we move to an MI kind of phase, just maintaining it and testing it. And finally, it's gonna start wearing out eventually, and you're gonna do, do an MOC, right? So uh, the study, what it outlines is four different uh, types of maintenance programs uh, called reactive maintenance, preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance, and reliability-centered maintenance, okay? And I'm gonna touch briefly on each of those. I think we all know what reactive maintenance is. Reactive maintenance is um, not doing maintenance. <laughs> reactive maintenance is when something breaks, we fix it. And still common, still, still used, um, too often, okay? It's, the study showed it's the predominant mode of maintenance. 55% of all maintenance is reactive. People fix things when they're broken. Uh, pros and cons. Reactive maintenance, what people will say the pro is, uh, well, there's no line item in their budget for it because they're not doing it, right? So it pencils out nicely from that standpoint before the season. Um, and then less staff requirements because you don't have to have someone doing maintenance. But the cons are pretty evident unplanned downtime, overtime work, because something's gonna break in the middle of the night, uh, more expensive repairs, uh, inefficient use of your staff, okay? I think we all see why it's not a good, I even think most private industry sees why it's not a good or the best option. Preventive maintenance is a very common term, we're all familiar with it, and maybe even speak well of it, uh, but it's really an idea uh, developed by the, by the military, the US military, um, where we do things on schedules, based on time, okay? Um, and when you look at it from the military perspective where they've got a lot of people, and really with a lot of time, right? A lot of people on an aircraft carrier um, at a time when it's not a war are, are drilling, right? That's what they do. They do drills and they maintain equipment and they make sure they're ready to go. And so preventive maintenance makes a lot of sense. However, when you look at um, uh, some of the, uh, um, well, and, and before I go to that, uh, it showed, the study showed a 12, per, 12 to 18% savings over reactive. So preventive be is better than reactive. Um, but um, some of the cons is that it's labor intensive and you may be doing things uh, that you otherwise don't need to be doing, right? Um, you may be uh, doing it every year when it could be done every two years and you could be saving money, okay? So um, that's preventive maintenance. I'm going, I know I'm going a little quickly just because time's uh, running out. So predictive maintenance, which might be a new term to some of you, is one that's really growing in our industry. And as Coupas, I think you should be f familiar with it. And that is, instead of doing just preventive maintenance, like on a regular yearly schedule or monthly schedule, uh, 
predictive maintenance is where we uh, begin to use technology, we begin to use training, we begin to use our understanding uh, to better pinpoint when maintenance needs to occur. Okay? Um, and so the classic example on an ammonia refrigeration system is on a screw compressor, that's very common, I'll add, is test doing an oil analysis on a screw compressor. We, put, we don't just change the oil every year, it's too much oil, it costs a lot of money. So we pull a sample, we test the oil, if it's bad, we change the oil, if it's good, we continue to run it. So the predictive maintenance, the, the testing of it is the predictive part. Um, vibration analysis is another form of predictive maintenance. We don't just replace the bearings on a screw compressor uh, just because five years have gone by. But what we would recommend maybe is they do vibration analysis on a regular basis so they can trend the condition of those bearings and pinpoint, okay, the bearing failure is gonna, is gonna start occurring around this time. Ultrasonic thickness testing. We don't replace pipes just because they've been in service 20 years. A pipe that's been in service 20 years uh, might be in horrible condition, but it might be in great condition, right? I mean, it could, it could be either way, but doing ultrasonic testing on the pipe gives us an idea, more information, right? So the, uh, predictive maintenance might be kind of a, this is, I believe, the direction I'd like to see the industry go in adopting more predictive tools. Now, what does predictive maintenance require? What are the cons, you might say? Um, there is an investment. The investment is in the diagnostic equipment. So to do ultrasonic testing, do vibration analysis, it costs, uh, it costs money to get that equipment to do the training. You might have to have a higher skill level of personnel that's able to do that. Um, these are all challenges to predictive maintenance. Um, and it might be hard to convince somebody of the savings. Vibration analysis, for those that aren't doing it now, aren't familiar, it's a difficult sale still sometimes. People sometimes like, okay, I hear a weird noise, now I want to do vibration analysis. That's actually kind of reactive, right? You see what I'm saying? That's kind of a reactive maintenance. Prevent, uh, predictive maintenance will say we're going to do it uh, before we hear the noise so that we can determine the condition and, and begin trending that, okay? And so, then what the article and the study eventually, um, so here's a brief example, but we're kind of running, running low on time, um, so I'm gonna skip that. So what, what the holistic approach that the article or the study is promoting is what's called reliability-centered maintenance. Um, believe it or not, I just, just today, you might be seeing this as job titles more often. The main, I was at a facility where they've been working with the maintenance manager and his job title changed. His job title is no longer maintenance manager, it's reliability manager. So I, it was interesting as, as I was going into this talk, even seeing that, but that's what they're promoting in the study is what they call reliability-centered maintenance, which says that not all maintenance should be treated the same way. Uh, that we want to use the technology that we have, the understanding that we have, the criticality of the component, and decide based on that. So there are certain types of components where reactive maintenance um, May still be uh, may still be fine. I think of a component, um, you know, a um, that for whatever reason is inaccessible or uncritical. It may still be fine to let it go until it breaks because uh, it's not going to harm anything and it's easy to fix. Um, but there may be um, there may be and there may be other things. Let's say greasing a bearing um, that should just be done on a on a preventive maintenance schedule. Just do it every year because it's easy to do. No sense in testing the grease and the bearings for, let's say, a fan because that's overkill. Uh, but some combination that combines reactive, preventive, and predictive to form a really uh, solid maintenance or mechanical integrity schedule um, you know, that meets the needs of that facility. Okay? Um, I, I promote this. I think it, we face challenges because, again, it, it's hard to convince people. It's hard to convince people, but um, the, the study showed this, and this is across the board in their study that is the Department of Energy, um, that reactive maintenance, the annual cost uh, uh, per horsepower per year, so that's what this number is, is $18 per horsepower year, per year it'll cost you if you go fully reactive, no planned maintenance. If you do a preventative program, it's gonna be $12, $13 per 
horsepower per year. So you got a considerable savings there. If you go predictive predominantly, you'll be down to the $9 per horsepower per year. And then finally, you combine these in a way that best suits you and you can really see your best, best savings. So um, anyways, really, really interesting uh, to me and I have the article up here, but you can download that as well in the Department of, uh, Department of Energy study. So here are some examples when it comes to reliability centered maintenance um, in ammonia systems, particular areas to emphasize. We talked about vibration analysis, ultrasonic thickness testing of pipe and vessels to start trending where we are in the cycle, um, oil analysis on screw compressors. Um, see, I think you even maybe look at a screw compressor and a recip compressor differently because of the quantities of oil and a recip, it may still make sense to just do it every year because the cost is so low, okay? Uh, ammonia, uh, ammonia detection, uh, as far as uh, calibration, you need to follow manufacturer's recommendations, uh, but maybe some combination of calibrating it annually, but also doing like a bump test uh, periodically just to see if it functions in some way. Um, um, relief valve, uh, discharge pipe, oil draining, um, um, and, com and then com finally compressor maintenance, which ties back to vibration analysis. Um, each one of these, um, so oil draining, uh, back, I'll say just a quickly about that. Um, you might have it based in your maintenance program that uh, you're gonna drain oil every year. Or, or, but, but really, if you go to that oil draining station and it has uh, 100 gallons of oil in there, uh, you should probably be draining it more often than that or fixing whatever's causing that much oil to get in there. But you know, you get what I'm saying. Um, but based off of your operating experience, you're, you're going to be pinpointing and, and dialing in your maintenance or mechanical integrity program. Okay? So I know my time is... Uh just about up. So, and that's my last slide. So I appreciate your guys' time. Hope, hope that uh, benefited you guys in some way. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer them. But I know we only have a couple more minutes for the, I think there's one more talk in here that we'll start. Um, so if you wanted the, the handouts, I printed a few, not enough probably for everybody, but feel free to take them. Um, and uh, again, just thank you.